you've got your Bibles, and I always hope that you do or have it on your device somehow, uh, I'd like you to turn to First Thessalonians. It's the the T's. You know, you got Timothy, Titus. You know, all in the same category. First Thessalonians. We're going to talk today about encouraging flourishing. <laughs> little tongue twister there, encouraging flourishing as we think about our own lives and how God's calling us, calling us to be supporters of others' growth as well as our own. That's really some good lessons out of this, uh, this book for the summer here as we think about how God might use our lives for him. Um, I'm just going to read the first six verses of this, and um, you can follow along. From Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. Think of those words for a minute. Grace and peace. Paul loved to focus on those items. Grace and peace. And peace. The people writing this were uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the missionary crew, the missionary team. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And this is the first that we know of, of Paul's letters that he wrote. It's not a prison letter, it's not a letter he wrote from prison, which most of his letters were written while he was incarcerated. This one was not that we know of. This was a non prison letter, and it's kind of reflective of his, uh, of his freedom. Let's read on. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Let's just pause and pray for a minute. Heavenly Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for this word from you. Would you uh, enliven and bring to our mind uh, options for our growth and our flourishing out of this passage? Would you show us what the apostle would have seen and what he wanted the Thessalonian church to see? Would you bring it to life today in Olympia for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, there's a full story about how Paul planted the church in Thessalonica. You know, he was on this uh, tour, and everywhere he went, there erupted a a riot. I don't know about you, but where I go, you know, we have tea, or we have a cup of coffee. You know, not not very many riots break out because of the gospel and the church. But that's what was happening. And as Paul went to places like Philippi in the early kingdom, um, they got really upset. And the the Jewish people got really jealous of his uh, bringing people to Christ. And they started uh, persecuting him. So as... uh, Paul was dealing with that. Here's what it says in Acts 17 about Thessalonica. And you don't need to turn there. I'll just read it for you real quick. Now, when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Is that a fun word? Uh, You know how I like to have you say things after me? Thessalonica. Let's repeat that. Thessalonica. You know, uh, Alexander the Great's sister, was named Thessalonica. And this city was named after her. It was a city of about 250,000 at the time. It was right on a trade route. So it got a lot of commerce. 
It was a, a, a bustling city and, and place. And Paul kept targeting places like that because he wanted to see the gospel spread and spread rapidly and be glorified. And so here's Thessalonica where he says, there was a synagogue there in Thessalonica. So at least 10 Jewish men in a city made up a synagogue. You had to have 10 Jewish men to make a synagogue. And this place had a synagogue. So Paul's custom was to always go and start with the synagogue. You had God-fearers, God-believers. They might not yet be schooled in who Jesus was, that the Jewish Messiah had actually shown up, but that's what he would teach. It says, there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three successive Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. That was Paul's simple message. He didn't have a long sermon, okay? Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, He is the son of the living God, and he is the Jewish promised, prophesied Messiah. And he would get converts from that. In fact, listen to what it says. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few leading women. So he had converts in the Jewish synagogue, and he had non-Jewish converts, the Greeks. And in this case, there were Leading, they called it, women, which was unusual for this day and time, but it happened in Philippi with Lydia and the women that were there and happened here. The church was made up of both genders, and that was important, and that's why it's emphasized here. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul inside us, a great many devout Greeks and not a few leading women, but the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. We almost have a a Black Lives Matter kind of thing. You know how we had the riots a year ago and uh, looting and things going on that were in addition to the riots? That's what was happening here. They were intentionally causing a riot to get Paul and his um, fellow companions in trouble. They went to Jason's house because that's where Paul was staying. Paul didn't come out. In fact, it says they um, they were seeking to bring Paul out to the crowd. And when they could not find Paul, they dragged Jason, the homeowner, and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down and they've come here also to cause trouble. Well, they're the ones that had caused the trouble, but uh, they were trying to get the sentiment to go against the apostle Paul. So Paul leaves town. He's had three Sabbath days of teaching in the synagogue. He's had three weeks to plant the gospel, and then he jets, and he takes off, and he leaves town for fear of his life. He doesn't, he's not ready yet to... He ends up being martyred for Christ, but he's not ready yet. And so he's going to preach somewhere else. That's the story behind the church at Thessalonica. So Paul, his only feeling is, I've planted the gospel in these people. I hope they're growing. So the Bible says when he could stand it no longer, he sent Timothy and said, go check on the church in Thessalonica. Go see how they're doing. Go give them some aid and encouragement. And when Timothy comes back, he hears the report of how they are doing, how they are faring, and where the gospel is taking root and expanding and expanding. So that's the the background behind this book. And we're gonna dig into it in a lot of ways. In fact, I'd like for us to think about four ways that you and I, could encourage growth in other people. 
okay? You may be here today saying, well, I want to grow. That's good. The best way you can grow is to put your eyes at helping someone else to grow. When you put your, your heart into helping someone else grow, you will surge forward yourself because of the unselfishness and focus that you will have. So what are some ways that you can encourage others? Do you have any in mind? They pop right out of the text. They pop right out of the text. The first one is to talk to God about those people. Pray for them. (laughs) Another way of saying, put your heart into prayer. Talk to God about them. That will help those people flourish. Do you pray for people on a regular basis? You know, we put together a prayer list. Paul had no prayer list. There was no printing done. He didn't know about these people except he knew spiritually that he needed to pray for them. What does it say? I constantly thank God for you. (laughs) Who is it in your life that you are constantly thanking God for in prayer? Shouldn't you be, shouldn't we be spending time, not just with our spouse, not just with our family, but asking God, thanking God for the body, thanking God for brothers and sisters in Christ, thanking God, talk to God about people, pray for them, pray for them with thanksgiving, thank God and give thanksgiving prayers. So I'm I'm saying today, spiritual prayers are what you need to pray about. Paul didn't have a list of of physical prayers like we so often, well, we need to pray for them because they've got COVID. We need to pray for them because they broke their leg. We need to pray for them. And and there's nothing wrong with the focus on physical prayers. (laughs) But that's not Paul's focus. His focus is thanksgiving prayers for people spiritually. His focus is thanksgiving prayers for where their lives are. Notice the second part of that. He regularly mentions them in prayer. Regularly mentioning you in my prayers. So there's this bringing people to the throne of God, mentioning them in your prayers. You might not know what's going on in someone's life, but whisper their name, whisper their family, spend time telling God that you're grateful and that you're lifting up their lives. What does the Bible say in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5? You guys know this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. For this, <laughs> give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You might be asking yourself the question, what's God's will for my life? I just want to know God's will for my life. Well, the biggest thing that he's going to say to you is, I want a relationship with you that's involving communication and prayer. Spend time in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Talk to God about the people that he's placed in your life. Thanking God for them and bringing them to his throne and asking him, God, to intervene. Maybe if we did this, we'd have more riots like Paul did. We wouldn't take the gospel so light. We would say, intensify the battle cry through prayer. Focus on what God is really doing in the midst of uh, of the family, in the midst of the church body. That's the first way to help someone flourish is talk to God about them. Think for a moment. Think of three people that you should be thanking God for on a regular basis. Think of three people. Maybe they're here in the church family. Maybe they're not. Three believers that you should be encouraged to help flourish in their life by praying for them. You know, when Paul's reading it, when Paul's um, thinking about the church in Thessalonica, he's thinking about specific individuals. Jason, whose house he stayed at. He's thinking about people who gave 
him hospitality and love. He's thinking about the people that he led to Jesus and saw baptized into Christ. He's thinking of specifics. Do you think about specific people that have been a blessing to you or coming to Christ or loving God in new ways? Think about it right now. Who is it? In fact, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, you you bring to our mind and our hearts those individuals that you're calling on us to lift up in prayer. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for the hope and joy that they have in you. But Lord, we're asking for them. We're bringing them to your throne, asking that you would put them on the forefront, the front edge of the battle for you and that your kingdom would move forward as we lift them up in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray for them. Second thing, second thing to help them flourish is to affirm the growth that you see. Acknowledge and affirm the growth that you see in them. What did Paul say? He said, we remember, we see God at work in you. We see the Lord at work in you. Here's how he put it. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We can see God at work in you. Have you ever used that phrase? So up at camp, every evening for campfire, We didn't have a special speaker, but we asked people to reveal God at work in their lives, either through the camp or through the year or somehow. So we had started with adults, kind of seeding the whole whole, uh, testimony time, but pretty soon the kids popped forward and said, could I share my, some of them froze up. Some of them in the midst of telling what God had done in their life, they started to talk about their mom, or something, I can't share anymore. One of them said, my mom is my hero. She's been with me. And it was like, I'm sorry, I can't say anymore. (laughs) How many times do we say, I see God at work in you. I see God at work in our lives. Do you have a God sighting? (laughs) It's so much fun to, 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 to emphasize that. And to work on that. Paul said, I see your work produced by faith. Jot that down if you don't have that on your paper. Work produced by faith. Now, we're not talking about working to gain salvation here. What were you talking about? Working because you are saved. It's work produced by the faith that you've got. Don't anyone ever think that you have to work your way, earn your way, be, um, it's the opposite. Salvation, the grace of God, is freely given. It is not earned. It's not deserved. That's what makes it grace. But when we receive grace by faith, there's a work that can't be. This is what the apostle uh, James says. You show me your faith without works. I'm going to show you my faith by my works. There's work that exhibits and identifies the faith that's inside of us. Not working for salvation, but because we are saved. Labor prompted by love. That's a little different word. Work is real general, a labor of love. You've heard of that before. A labor of love. What's your labor produced or prompted by love? In some cases, we need to stretch ourselves. Well, that's not my ministry. Well, maybe the labor of love would be to stretch outside your ministry. In our church here today, we have uh, lots of needs, lots of opportunities. Stretch beyond and say, this is a labor, a labor of love. And the last one is about endurance. It's about continuing. It's about not ever giving up. Uh, New New American Standard says steadfastness of hope. I like that one too. Steadfastness 
What's steadfastness? It's immovable. It's enduring. It continues against all opposition. What helps someone do that? Where they say, I'll never give up. Hope. Hope. Here's what First uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says. But what we suffer now is nothing compared to what he will be give us, give us there. So there's this hope ahead. See, Paul left this group behind under persecution. He knew they were going to be drug into beatings. He knew that these new believers were going to have their faith tested to the deepest level. And he heard from Timothy, these guys, they've not given up. They're staying firm and steadfast in their faith. They have prompted by love works. They have inspired endurance. This is the kind of thing. Nothing compared to the glory that he will give us, even though we're persecuted, even though we're under um, duress and need. God's plan is always for us to endure, inspired by hope. You know, in today's world, hope is more needed now than ever before. The reason we have suicide rates the way we do is because people have lost hope. People have lost the endurance inspired by hope and they just give up. They give up on their faith or they give up on life and what God has has designed for them. Number three, number three, celebrate their relationship. Here it says sonship, it would be sonship or daughtership. (laughs) You know, celebrate the relationship that they've got. That's a way to help them flourish spiritually. Celebrate. Folks, we should be a church of Jesus Christ that celebrates our relationship. Do you realize you're a child of the most high God? Do you realize that you've been adopted into his kingdom as a son or a daughter? You are no longer a straggler, an a, 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 a orphan. You are now part of God's dear family. We should be telling each other that on a regular basis, just like Paul does here. Remember who you are. Caitlin's song a little earlier. It's my identity comes from you, Heavenly Father. My identity comes from who you've made me to be. And who's he made us to be? Sons, daughters of the Most High God. Here's how he says it in this. God loves you and has chosen you to be his own. Oh, let that sink in for a minute. God loves you and he's chosen you to be his own. Loved by God and he has chosen you. Two things, loved and chosen. Now how God works that, I don't know. I'm thinking about when I was a sophomore in high school and made a specific choice. I am going to give my life to loving God. I'm going to give my life to loving Jesus. Now, according to this, he chose me. But according to my thinking, I chose him. How does that happen? I chose him or he chose me? Yes. Simultaneously. (laughs) He's not going to thwart the person's will and force us to love him but he offers the opportunity. He gives us grace and says, will you receive my love? And when we do, (laughs) he loves us and we are chosen by him. My choosing and God's choosing happened at the same time. And oh, I celebrate that. He can't, he doesn't force us, but God chose us just as we choose him. Are you choosing him? Today, are you celebrating that? And are you able to let others in your life into that window that says, celebrate your sonship, celebrate your daughterhood, celebrate who you are in Jesus. If there was ever a time when we needed to hear that from one another, it's today, it's right now. We need to hear from one another. You are a child of God. You are in the kingdom of light, not the kingdom of darkness. You are walking as a representative of God, your heavenly father. Stand up, be encouraged, celebrate who God is to you 
and to us. In our day and age of the lack of acceptance, the lack of uh, identity, those two things, God loving us and accepting us, are vital. You know, I used to get called on to be the team captain, and we used to have to stand at the bat stop and choose teams. It was like a pickup game, you know, like they do in elementary school. And, uh, you know, you've got, you got kids at all ranges of skill, right, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> all ranges of size, all ranges of ability. And you've got, you know, oh, 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 pick me. And you've got someone in the back going, oh, in a way, I hope he doesn't pick me, you know. <laughs> and that idea, I mean, he's, he's, he's showing us, God chose you to be on his, it's as if he said, you're the most important person, join my team, be a part with me. I will be your heavenly father and you will be my dearly beloved child. Let's go together into the needs and see people's lives changed. Being picked (laughs) unconditionally, he loves us so much. Celebrate a person's relationship. Jesus said it this way, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I have appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. He wants to partner with us and make us, allow us to be fruit producing. You remember this one, right? You are a chosen person race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that he may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen race. You are a chosen people. You're a chosen person. Celebrate that and allow yourself, allow your words to show celebration for, for others as well. Let's take the last one here. Mentor by modeling. Mentor by modeling. We're going to talk a lot about in this book about mentors and about modeling because it's one of the themes. The word for mentor would be the same as we would say mimic. Like a mime would do everything that the other person does. That's the idea of mimic what God has done. In this case, mimic what people who mimic God have done. Here's what it says. Um, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord and you received the word with much affliction and with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Think of this for a minute. Severe suffering. This church was under severe suffering. That's why Paul was so anxious to hear. Are they making it? Are they surviving? What's their faith going like? How, is, how are they doing? Tell me, please, how is this baby church surviving? He says, out of in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message and with joy given by the Holy Spirit. You'd say, well, if they were under such suffering, where'd the joy come from? It says it right there. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. You know, we sometimes say the joy of the Lord is my strength, biblical phrase repeated over and over again. How does that, how does that work? <laughs> Probably a couple different ways. I love to see, look at it this way. When you're thinking about the, the Lord's joy, that becomes your strength and your motivation. Just like when it says Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Because of the joy set before him. Think about for a minute, the joy you're producing in God. The joy you're producing in the Lord. That becomes your strength. It seems like that's the case with these baby Christians in Thessalonica. They were struggling under severe persecution. 
but they had a joy about them given by the Holy Spirit. They had a joy of the Lord in their life. Oh, folks, what if that wells up in us instead of feeling beaten down and trudging along, discouraged and depressed and... and, and uh, no, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit mount up within you where instead of feeling down, it's just the opposite. It says, we counted ourselves with joy because we were counted worthy to suffer for his name and for his sake. It's like the joy came from a totally different source. They were modeling that. You received the word with much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned earlier the the testimonies of camp. I'm still inspired by what you see kids give their heart to Christ. You see them the next year or the next couple of years and you see growth and power taking place in their life. And they testify to the group. Here's what God has. And we need to do that more, not just around a campfire, but in our small groups, in our Bible classes, in a settings like this, where we're just casually visiting, speak of the power of God at work in your life. He says, that's what happened. You didn't receive this word like just a word. You received it with power, with power. The gospel is filled with power. We're gonna spend time on that next week, drilling into the power of the gospel, Paul says. Because Paul's the one who says, I want you to imitate me, not because I'm so good, But he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm gonna imitate Jesus and you can look at me and imitate me. Now, if at any point I get off from from imitating Jesus, you look to him. But if you need a human example of what it means to have faith and trust in him, you look at me. Now, I wanna ask you the question. I've asked this once before. Who is it that you've ever said that to? Who in your life Have you ever come close enough to and said, I will be for you a model and example and a mentor. You can follow me as I follow Christ. Are you either number one, close enough to another person to be able to say that? Or number two, bold enough to say that to another person? Because what does that take? That takes a person with a life that's somewhat framed by where Jesus is at. Are you willing today to be a mentor to be a model, to be an example that you say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. One thing that'll do is put you uh, on the hot seat. Someone's looking at your life. Someone's close enough to look at your life. We don't like that as Americans. We don't like that as as 20th century, 21st century um, Western Civ guys and gals. We don't want people getting that close to hold us accountable. But that's a supreme challenge. Are you up to it? Are you willing to look for one person in your world? Now, they might be a young person. I, I pray that they are. <laughs> they might be a child. They might be a teen. Say, hey, hey, you, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Jesus. Imitate me because I'm imitating the one that you need to be imitating. Kids need God with skin on. (laughs) They need you to lead in a way them closer and closer uh, to the Lord. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. What did Jesus say? We're to walk the same way he walked. We have become imitators of Jesus (laughs) Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in Jesus as Jesus walked. 1 John 2, verse 6. One more, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this we have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you must follow in his steps. Follow in his steps. Remember hearing about a... um, preacher that was on a Florida trip and he was, had a guide with him and they were, had a busload of, of people that were going out into the swamps. 
They were going to look for alligators, <laughs> snakes, all kinds of things that, you know, would be uh, in the swamp. And as they got out of the bus, the, 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 the guide stopped them all. And he said, here's the first rule. Here's the only rule. Only step where I step. I know where the quicksand is. I know where the reptiles are. I know where the caves are, the, 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 the holes. He says, only step where I step. And in a way, that's what we can say to those behind us. Follow me. I know the pitfalls. <laughs> I've been through some storms here. Follow me as I follow after Christ. I will be a mentor and a model for you. That's the experience because we know what God has in mind. So talk to God about the people that you're wanting to see flourish. Acknowledge their growth. Let yourself see and the celebration of their relationship. And finally, mentor them by modeling what Jesus is about in this world. Are you willing to be like the early believers in Thessalonica? But Paul was so excited to see how they encouraged flourishing. I want to encourage you. You can be used by the Lord this week, this time, this season for him. Let's bow in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. You are so incredible. You show us so many ways we can be used by you. And so, Lord, we're asking today that you would remove any barriers, remove any roadblocks to us being used by you. Help us to be in, in, a, in a constantly unceasing mode of prayer with and for each other. Help us, Lord, to, to recognize growth in people and to encourage them about that growth. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be um, modeling and being a mentor to those who are younger in Christ. And Lord, we just pray for all of this because we believe that you want us to be a model as well for the bigger and broader kingdom. Thank you again, Lord. Use this time.